Well, good day, everyone. I'm Kurt, and um, yeah, welcome to Sydney, Australia. Um, and uh, thanks for joining my session. Um, and thank you as well for the uh, organisers of the, uh, the summit. Um, it's been really amazing. Um, and I'm really excited to be able to talk about uh, Viper. And uh, it's been something I've been working on for, for many years and something that I'm excited about to release to the community. Um, it's certainly something that I've used to develop systems for over the last few years. And uh, I think it, uh, yeah, it's happy to, to talk about it and to, and to So a little bit about me. Um, so um, physics and uh, I've been coding in LabVIEW for oh, 25 years. Uh, originally LabVIEW 4, where I had done, uh, that was doing my uh, honours uh, thesis. Um, I've uh, worked for several uh, alliance businesses in Australia. We used to work with uh, Chris Farmer, so I know Chris very well. Uh, thank you for moderating, Chris. And uh, I ran my own NI alliance business. Uh, very interested in uh, OO design um, and architecture. And uh, years ago, I, uh, back in 2004, built Good Developer, which allowed you to build classes that uh, implemented inheritance. That was a lot of fun um, and worked with uh, Jim Cream to uh, build that tool a bit better and uh, improve it. And um, that was exciting. Uh, for Finisar's, uh, Systems engineer, uh, worked with Cochlear as a test systems lead architect. And uh, now I'm a co founder, and, uh, which is a platform that supervises manufacturing. You know, briefly about Medulla. And, uh, so, um, so, Medulla is a platform that supervises your manufacturing no matter where you manufacture. It's the ability to view and administrate your no matter where you manufacture. And uh, it ensures that your manufacturing workflows are adhered to and provides uh, traceability reports. And essentially removes the paper traveler from your manufacturing line by digitizing it. Eliminates human error by ensuring things like uh, faulty product doesn't get back onto the line, manufacturing steps aren't missed, um, products not tampered with and brought back onto the line. So. It's, uh, it, it greatly reduces the risk of human error. So uh, if you're interested in that and uh, you know, you're very familiar with paper presses, want to get rid of them, then uh, have a chat to us. You know, let's move on. Um, before I continue, though, uh, a shout out to my uh, niece, Darcy Cooper. And uh, she's an exceptionally gifted young woman, uh, way above her years in uh, science and mathematics. Uh, she's, she's studying at a couple of years above her level. Um, absolute whiz in coding. And she came over and did uh, a week's uh, work experience with us uh, just at the beginning of the year. And uh, she just exceeded all of our expectations. We gave her a Raspberry Pi to go away and uh, do some little projects. And it was like, she just couldn't get enough. And she was so excited. So um, she's uh, going to pursue a career in STEM and uh, she's thinking about what she wants to do, and she's looking very closely at, at AI. So that's exciting, and I'm very proud of her. And that's my son there as well, sporting the latest Modella fashion. Okay. So I'm going to get down. All right, so let's talk about Viper. So Viper is a OO framework that allows you to build systems that implement dependency injection. Uh, Viper-based systems assemble themselves at runtime from a collection of pre-built and pre-verified components that sit outside the executable. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the, the motivation about building this. And uh, I never set out to go, okay, I want to um, go and build uh, um, dependency injection. Um, when I was sort of thinking about all this, it was, I had a real problem I wanted to solve. And uh, it's going back 10 years or so, and uh, I was uh, running my own alliance business and doing test systems. And the problem I was thinking about is change management uh, 
in especially within regulated markets, particularly medical device manufacturing. And that problem was how do you implement change on uh, you know, quite complex systems uh, without having to go through what is essentially a, a very um, rigorous top to bottom verification. And no matter what change you make to these systems, uh, whether it's uh, big or small, um, you need to change driver, update a driver, fix a bug, whatever it might be, it triggers that process. A very extensive, time consuming and expensive process of uh, software verification. So all these systems basically you know, the, the problem that exists with basically they're all built as just a big executable. So all the dependencies lie within the executable. So if you want to go and change a driver or fix fix a driver or fix an issue, that, that issue sits inside the executable and it gets um, compiled and deployed. So that was the problem I was, I was looking at. And uh, so I started to think about wouldn't it be amazing if all those dependencies sat outside the executable? Uh, but they were sucked in as, as needed, and all these dependencies could be um, pre-verified. And so your change management problem just got a lot more simpler And that all you should really have to do is just pre-verify the, um, the, the component that changes, not the whole big ball of mud, <laughs> just this thing that you can change. So I started to uh, play around with um, uh, like plugin architectures and um, pack libraries and uh, using a lot of the OO uh, sort of expertise that I've got and started to build an architecture uh, that I originally called Viking. And uh, started to build some systems with Viking. And, uh, this is a couple that uh, I've developed years ago. Um, one on the, uh, the left, uh, that's a, uh, a navigation system uh, or test navigation system for things like combine harvesters and, and heavy uh, agricultural machinery. Uh, the one on the right is a um, uh, implantable medical device. So these were, were built with Viking years ago. Um, so, um, I then started to, uh, contract into Cochlea and, uh, brought the Viking architect to Cochlea and we started to use it within Cochlea. And, uh, again, we had, uh, were able to, to use, uh, this, this plugin architecture, this sort of dependency injection to, um, uh, greatly reduce the overhead of uh, verification, and uh, that that was a was a large large problem that we had in Cochlear. Um, the time taken to verify um, our systems. So to look at the problem simply, um, so imagine you've got a complex medical um, uh, medical device tester. Um, and you just need to do something fairly simple, like just update a Xilinx uh, JTAG driver for whatever reason. So you really don't want to do this because you know what you're in for, but it has to be done. So you do the software development and you build a uh, unverified um, executable. Then that uh, then you've got to go through this entire stack of um, verification protocol. It's a system verification protocol, top to bottom. It might have been a small change, but you've got to uh, re-verify the entire thing. You've got to uh, that, um, that deliver it correctly. The driver doesn't really touch any of that. You've up revisioned the build, so it has to be done. And so it's this cycle that starts. And you work from the top and you work, go all the way to the bottom. And whenever you find something that doesn't uh, satisfy the protocol, you go back 
and you cycle again and again and again until you get to a verified build. And then you can go to that uh, process of uh, deploying it. Again, this is very simplified and uh, you know, there are a lot of other macronym label, label processes and documents that uh, uh, come into play in all of this, but this is it in a nutshell. This is a very expensive process, very time consuming and a lot of pain. And uh, nobody wants to do it. <clears throat> so uh, change uh, is, uh, doesn't happen absolutely necessary. And, uh, and sometimes there are things that have to, that just get put off. There might be a known issue, uh, you just deal with it. Um, and there's a low level of change phobia because of, of this process. So, <clears throat> so Viking, Viking back there, but uh, they call it Viper, it's the next generation, uh, reduces this load by instead of having to um, verify a big executable, a great big ball of mud, you're just re-verifying uh, a, a component that's changed. And so we use pack libraries and say the JTAG driver has to be updated, then you just make that change. You build an unverified JTAG driver, run a very slim verification protocol on that, cycle if needed, and uh, then you've uh, got a, a verified um, driver or component. Then you can then go down to that process of, of deploying it. That severely cuts out the, the weight tests and documentation uh, that has to be done. The, the people that get tied up in this and having to free them up is, is yeah. and we saw a significant reduction in our costs in implementing this strategy. Um, and people ask me about dependency injection and, uh, and Viper and, and what is it, how does it work? I just go, well, it's like a box of Lego and a kid. Uh, it's the simplest way to think of it. So a kid give them a box of Lego, it has full of components, and you want them to build something. We'll just give them a document, it's the instructions, and they go away and build it. So our instructions are called an object definition document. That's what I call it. Sounds good. Um, and uh, so you just, that goes into the constructor and it goes and picks up all the uh, components that it needs and, and assembles it in to the final object that you want in the correct order, hierarchy, configured how it needs to be according to the object definition document. Uh, if we want to make change, well, that's fairly easy. We just modify the object definition document to um, put a different component where it needs to go. Um, and so we can you know, build either a penguin or a, or a butterfly. It just depends on the object definition that you bring into the, to do that. So that's that the simple. Obviously, there's a whole lot more to it than and, uh, kids and Lego. But um, uh, that's, that's a good way to do it. And using that, we can sort of visualize how we can uh, particular test system. Again, Viper is very useful for test systems, but it's not all about building test systems. So you can build anything you want with, with Viper. So again, Box of Lego is uh, a, um, uh, just a, a load of um, pack libraries, uh, which are called components. And so you can see that there's uh, things like Modula ATE. Well, that's, that's the test executive. That, that is a component. Um, we got uh, things like um, uh, frequency counters, uh, and you can see that there's some concrete and abstract uh, classes there. Uh, frequency counter base, frequency counter, uh, we've got uh, switching, uh, JTAG, uh, how we visualize the test data, test view panel or test view tree. But they will inherit from test view base and it inherits from Viper. Viper. Um, so we feed in a object definition document, just an XML document, into the constructor, which is Viper. And again, it's a component. 
wrapped up in a very slim executable to, to do this. So it feeds in that document into the basic mechanics of Viper that goes away and then um, iteratively, uh, recursively goes and constructs the object that's asked to, to build. And so, for example, say we change how we view the data. Um, say later on, somebody makes a decision that they want to operate a view, and nobody ever thought that that's what you'd want, but now it's what they want. So now let's, how can we change that? Well, you could just modify your object definition document, go and build a test view panel six, that shows the, the devices under test and, uh, and what's going on with each one, and uh, reject it. And now we've got a system that uh, can show uh, all six uh, units under test. So that's how you can implement change. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's highly agile. And uh, one of the great things about it is it's, uh, you can, you can you can implement change. You can uh, you can add functionality later. You don't have to design it in at the start. You don't have to uh, have every variant of driver that you might possibly want to have and have it all built inside your executable for future use. It's you just plunk more pieces of Lego in as you want to. Um, so, as I was saying, this is this architecture is being used. It's uh, being used to um, develop real systems that are out there working. Cockley is using uh, Viking. It's the predecessor to this architecture I've now called Viper. Um, so that's testing implants and sound processes and making sure that those, uh, those devices are safe and effective and have been doing so for many years. Um, so I've been using the new architecture uh, for several clients, one in particular, that's been a really nice uh, project is uh, for a company called Ordinate. And uh, they make um, basically networkable audio hardware. Um, a lot of their hardware goes into, or well, products go into OEMs. But uh, they've uh, got several, several different kinds of product and uh, done test systems for a few of them. Um, but one interesting one was their uh, adapters product, which they released uh, last year. So we used uh, Viper to build the test system, and uh, it's capable of testing a uh, well, panel of um, devices, but all the uh, different uh, variants of the adapters as well. And that's managed by just having different object definitions for different kinds of um, of product that you might use different resources for different variants of product. And um, they're also uh, developing a, a new product that is, that is, I would say, widely different from the adapters. Um, but we're basically using the same box of Lego, if you like, with just a couple of extra um, components put in to manage the test logic and different instruments that they've got. And we just feed a an object definition in and it builds the test system for the new, the, the completely different um, product that I can't talk about. <laughs> um, it's coming out soon. Um, so, um, this this is a very nice test system. It's got uh, interchangeable jigs cartridges that pop in and out and uh, all running from PXI and has a whole load of other instrumentation off the side that you can't see, um, audio analysis audio analyzers and yeah. Um, but um, one of the uh, benefits you get as well with Viper is a whole lot of debug tools and engineering tools. So every component uh, that, um, that you build um, has a software panel. So you can bring that up and uh, that will update the, itself as it gets uh, interacted with by the test system, or you can pause and, um, and uh, interact with it, or you can just load them up by themselves, load up several, um, very useful for debugging, problem solving, um, 
but also very useful for prototyping tests as well. I've always found it's uh, uh, very useful to build all your instrument components and, and your uh, components that talk to uh, the DAT, and then you can start prototyping tests by using those tools. So the way that uh, we, we can um, do that is, uh, well, one of the main ways of working with Viper-based projects is the object editor. So this allows you to um, build that object definition document, uh, that uh, very deep um, hierarchical um, XML document that you don't want to do by hand, <laughs> no way. Um, but um, what this does is when you're uh, using it, it's actually um, injecting those um, components, those objects into the object editor themselves and you're working with them live, yeah, live in there. And uh, you can then instantiate them, show the soft front panel, uh, change the configuration of those particular instances and, uh, and save it and inject objects wherever you want to. Uh, you, know, you can inject uh, objects into ancestors, you can inject them in, inject self into self, uh, what you can do. Um, so that's a, a very useful tool. Um, it makes working with this stuff actually possible. <laughs> um, we didn't have this when we were at Cochlear and uh, we had to basically do these things by doing these object definition documents, uh, basically by cutting and pasting into Excel modifying Excel and, and um, yeah, it's much better. Um, also, we, there is a, um, uh, you can create a, a new um, Viper component uh, just by creating a project and there it is, it's just a template. And uh, click on that and you'll have a little wizard that will go and generate one for you. Uh, it's a lot of scripting that happens to do that. Um, but that's extremely useful. So, any questions so far? Okay. Uh, okay. Um, yep. Okay. Not, cool. not so far. Cool. I, I, I just want to let you know I ran a, a little poll. <clears throat> if anyone wants to go uh -huh. jump on there, the poll question is Do you know what dependency injection means? So, um, we've got five votes so far. Four people say okay. kind of, and one person says never heard of it, but we'll we'll see how that <laughs> progresses. The thing is, like, um, go back, even when I was working, I didn't know what dependency injection was. Um, I had a problem I wanted to solve, and uh, it was only until uh, I went over to NI Week and I was having a chat to Jim, Jim Cream, and I was showing him some of the stuff that uh, I was working on, and he goes, ah, it's the injection. So, oh, okay. <laughs> So, don't think you need to know what it is, but uh, it, it certainly solves a problem. Um, and, you know, look, my, my implementation might not be the academic form of, you know, dependency injection, but it uh, solves a problem. Okay. It's a lot of fun. Can I, I have a question? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, have you looked at uh, the interfaces in LabVIEW 2020 and, and how will that change um, Viper for, 20, for, for LabVIEW 2020? I haven't had a chance to play with it yet, so but I am excited to have a look and uh, no doubt there's going to be some impl 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 implications uh, for Viper. Um, Viper does implement a form of interface. Um, a test executive needs to basically out of run methods by name. And uh, so it needs to be able to um, suck in that test class and then uh, and in, and um, poke data in and pull data out. So uh, that, that interface is native, native interfaces might, um, might solve some problems so, or will make things a bit easier and a bit cleaner. So we'll take a look at that. Have you played with uh, yourself, Chris? I have not uh, installed 2020 yet. I haven't had the luxury. No. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, well, we, we've uh, we've stuck with 2019 at the moment, and uh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I really want to to push to 2020. Yeah, you've had a few I more answers that, to that to that poll now. You've got one person saying they're an expert in in, in dependency injection. Seven people I think say kind yeah, yeah, seven people say kinda, yeah. and two people are saying never heard of it. So there you go. Okay, okay. I oh, will just think of a box of Lego. There we go. A little bit <laughs> playing with it. That's all you need. <laughs> I'm sure Dimitri and uh, and Philip would uh, say a little bit more. Um, all right. Well, let's let's run some demos um, and show the cool stuff. Uh, okay. Let me just close that down, and I'm going to shift views. Um, just move things around. Sorry, guys. Um, okay, back to. Okay, great, great. So, um, putting flux capacitors, and that be fun. And um, so you contract out uh, to, you know, to your contract manufacturer to uh, go and uh, build and test flux capacitors. So um, the operator in the morning goes to his machine and uh, does what he does every morning and just goes and clicks the shortcut to the flux capacitor test system. And here it is. And they log in. what we call a spec. A spec is not the object definition document, but that is basically uh, your recipe of tests containing all the uh, steps and uh, limits and things like that. So that's like that. And that, that could be different from different models um, of flux capacitor. And then we start. So in, let's scan a serial number on it. Okay, and off it goes. So yeah, test those capacitors. Uh, it's got some resistors in it. Uh, diode looks good, and then oh dear, oh, clock frequencies out. That's unusual. So they call up the engineer and say, "Look, we've got a problem." They they keep trying this, and it just keeps um, returning. Uh, um, and have a bound value. And so engineer comes down and says, okay, well, let's, let's take a closer look and see what's going on. Close this down. Let's open up and let's debug a bit and see what's going on. We'll open up the issue. Load that in. And this has basically now loaded all those, um, or injected, if you like, um, all of those components into the object editor. You can see the top level is the test executive, ATE. There's a test class called test flux capacitor. There's other things for um, you know, handling the duct and uh, barcode reading. We step down here a little bit more. There's um, a lot of uh, instruments, switches. Um, there's a uh, component to uh, talk to the flux capacitor, LCR meters, PS power supplies, uh, frequency counter. So let's show the soft front panel with the test executive. Let's move that over there. The engineer says, well, that particular test, the measurement for that, comes out of the frequency counter. Well, let's just open that up and let's have a look. Okay. Let's run it and see what happens. Okay. 
There we go. Oh, that looks, that doesn't look very good. Actually, our signal is really awful. What's going on there? So, okay, okay well, let's, let's look a little bit closer. Let's see what's going on. So, let's uh, open up our switch manager. This uh, which, uh, works on some uh, P site uh, switches and let's, let's switch a few things in and let's have a look around and what's going on. Uh, click that one up. Um, uh, there's another, another switch here as well. Uh, put the into that. So you interact a lot with these um, soft run panels. And uh, let's just run the, the test again. So they watch what's happening and look at all the instruments. Again, everything they do, it just something's going on with this um, signal here. So they end up getting a. a Standard uh, signal source and plug it into the, uh, the frequency counter and determine that the frequency counter is kaput. There's something wrong, and uh, they call up TTI and TTI say, "Well, we don't have any more of these. This discontinued, and we can't supply you another one." So that becomes a real problem. <laughs> um, that would be a bit of a nightmare, nightmare scenario for, for many manufacturing sites, particularly medical device manufacturing. So, and you know, there is a lot of uh, risk management around these things, but um, good thing is it's, it's in Viper. So, shut all this down. So they have a bit of a talk and uh, determine that uh, they can use a Brule and Kerr frequency counter. It's, um, it's a modern instrument and, uh, and they've got one, um, but they just need to build a driver for it and, uh, and then they can validate that driver and then get going again. So let's just go into flux capacitor, into the source, and here's all our component source. And they've already started building the, uh, the Bull and Kerr um, frequency counter component. Let's go into there and load that up. Okay. So this is a, a Viper component. This is source code. So you can see frequency counter BK inherits from frequency counter base, which inherits from fiber. So they've done all of the source for it, it's time to build it. Just before we do that, let me just show you that where this is going to go once it's built into the folder where the executive sits the object editor sits. Now look, there's only frequency counter base and frequency counter TTI here at the moment. That's what we ran that system with when I, I just demonstrated it. There is no BK here. Good. There it is. All right, now we can open our object editor. Now we need to change the object definition document. We need to take away the um, the TCI and adding the blue curve. So that's where that particular instrument sits. We can 
delete the object. And now I'm going to inject into the test class a frequency counter will occur. I just call it frequency counter. What's that system straight name? Pops up. Configure me. That's okay. And now we can. Whoops. <laughs> okay. I've probably made. I yes, and I've made a typo. Okay. Let me just close that down and not save it. Demos, hey. Read that one. That's right. Good. Okay. Frequency counter, and now I can. Show the software on panel of my test executive. Went through and, what, and injected all those into the test executive. When, if I go and show the software on panel for the um, frequency counter, I can see now it's a pull and curve. So speak, start. So there we go. Everyone's happy. And uh, we avoided all that pain. Uh, the verification process was just limited to the new rule and curve um, component, not the entire thing. Um, one thing I mentioned is like you can inject uh, objects wherever you please. I can go and add an object into uh, an ancestor. Uh, for instance, let's go and inject an object, da, da, da. There we go. <laughs> Inject self into self. Um, there's probably a lot of use cases for this. Uh, I haven't found them yet, but I'm sure there's going to be. I could keep going. Close it down, don't say it, but. Um, what I'll show you now, so I'm going to show you uh, just how to create a new Viper. Um, component and then I'll start to talk about the new Viper. Um, what I've been showing you is uh, uh, the, the previous generation. It's not, it's not Viking but it's um, but it's not compatible with RT. So but very very useful to build uh, Windows based systems and uh, you know, it's been very well proven and uh, that's what I will be releasing very shortly. Um, it's a very usable um, architecture. Um, but I'll be talking about the, the new version uh, soon, which is um, uh, compatible with uh, real time and uh, also uh, XML, it's all JSON based. But um, let's go and just build uh, a Viper, Viper class.
Okay, so so there we are. We just select five component, and we'll call this save. And it's just doing a lot of scripting in the background to build that component. There it is, it's just showing me the, the source for it all. Apple source. <laughs> so uh, just having a look at that, um, there's Viper. And then Apple, which inherits from Viper. Looking in the project folder, it always comes with two folders, whatever you build. There's your component source. And at the moment, there's only one component in there, Apple. And in components, you get a few things. You get Viper, and you get the object editor thrown in there as well, so you can work with it. You build your object definitions. So, Having a look, there's always this uh, put into the project called launch object. And uh, this is useful just for showing the objects software panel. So, the class that we've created is called Apple. Um, don't worry about component name, community. There we go. And it's just showing Apple's software panel. Um, I would go and edit that. There we go. A slim object definition just for calling Apple. If we look at this, though, what's going on underneath it? It's all Viper operating here. There is no dependency on Apple at all. We pass the object definition into create and it goes through and recursively constructs the whole object and it's, it instantiates all its sub objects and puts them where they need to go into their ancestors or into the concrete, wherever, and, and supplies the configuration. I'll just briefly go through this and I'll, I'll jump on to the, um, the new Viper, the RT stuff. I'm inside here. Well, we feed in the uh, object definition, it gets passed. And it breaks all that configuration up. Uh, defines all the ancestors and then starts instantiating more objects where they need to go. This is a recursive creator. Create calls recreate or calls create. A uh, bit of stuff initially to work out if you're working within dev or if it's happening within it's within a pack library. What's that uh, where it is. Um, there's also a lot of events and things to manage um, software panels and uh, also that updating that we saw. Uh, we're not trying to executive executive running and software panels getting updated. That, that assists that. So uh, initializing again it's just The apple, but then it calls back to um, the, the parent and performs the recursive iterate, recursive idiot. And, uh, and again, you've got a hierarchical object, it goes through and, and does some more. And there are a lot of other um, 
methods that I um, invite her to do things like showing the soft front panel, um, injecting other objects into that object um, that aren't defined within the uh, object definition. You can inject them later. And that is extremely useful. So that's that's the object definition. Well, if you go back to here, you saw the object definition for just launching Apple. Um, the object definition, what that actually looks like for um, the flux capacitor tester. Oops, sorry, in the wrong folder. It's object has config and has has test class it has other objects we can ingest. Um, switch manager has more objects. Um, so because we don't have to edit those type things by hand anymore. Um, what I'll do now um, is uh, no questions at the moment. Okay. Uh, there's no questions. Uh, um, Philippe's just made a couple of comments a uh, few uh -huh. minutes back. Uh, he was saying, yeah, interfaces, um, they're pretty straightforward to use. Feel free, nat feels very natural coming from using classes. Okay. And he also oh, said cool. that um, doing presentation is a use case, I think, in reference to um, when you're creating an object for the presentation. Oh, okay. Uh, that tool that you just had, um, XML Notepad, was it? Yeah. Is that a, a freely available tool? I hadn't seen that before. That looks kind of yeah, handy. Yeah, no, it's, it's a Microsoft thing. So, yeah, uh, very useful. Yeah, uh, limited in some ways. Um, yeah, very useful. Um, it's better than Notepad. <laughs> is that just um, freely downloadable? Is it? Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. yeah. Thank God. Um, <laughs> now um, I can show more of this stuff in the in the breakout room if uh, anybody wants to. Um, so what I'll show you now is. I, um, a project I'm actually working on at the moment for a client. And uh, this is testing um, medical device. Um, which, uh, I can't talk about who it is or what it is, but uh, um, there's nothing in here that can um, give anything away. So, but uh, this device, uh, the client wants to be able to test 50 to 100 of these units, um, all in parallel. So um, basically, you, uh, the operator will walk up and uh, plug uh, one of these units into a um, network port, and then the system will detect it and then start commencing tests. So it's an um, extremely parallel system. Uh, it, uh, it, it goes out and it uh, basically looks for devices uh, that have been connected, and when they have been connected, uh, instantiates a, a new um, uh, 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 workstation process uh, for each one, and uh, that incorporates all the tests and also calls uh, the API that uh, talks to the particular device. Also, it's sitting on an industrial controller, in our industrial controller. And so this also has to be able to take in uh, operators and engineers and managers connecting in uh, with multiple devices to uh, uh, either start executing tests or just uh, look at what's going on or administrate the system. So it requires a multi-connect uh, server to take uh, several 
different HMIs. And there's also the uh, multi-management of up to 50 or more um, uh, workstations. So that's an exciting challenge. <laughs> and uh, it's been a hell of a lot of fun. And uh, we're still working on that. And uh, I'm happy to show some of that. Um, so let me go in and look at the project so far. Um, there's a component, uh, T2, that's the actual medical device called T2. It's called something else, but uh, I'll call it T2. Um, there's a T2 connection manager, which uh, uh, creates or well, instantiates multiple ping managers. So it goes out to ping as many ports as you want, uh, instantiates all these pings and uh, they all run in parallel to go and sniff ports, see if there's a new one. So that's TT Connection Manager. Then we've got a uh, TT workstation, which uses T2, to, which is basically the logic of test. And that's, that's, that then gets uh, called, uh, instantiated multiple times, depending on how many T2s are plugged in by the TT workstation manager. So I'll open up the Workstation Manager. Now it's Viper, but it's, it's, this is the next version. And what we see as we open it up, a couple of projects or folders here. Windows, Linux 64, Linux ARM. Each of one of these has a project inside it. All named the same. But each one of these projects calls the dependent pack libraries from where they come from, whether it's Windows, ARM, or in 64, in 64 different places. Uh, it's been a real challenge to make this all work correctly, and uh, there's still a few little issues, but uh, it's working very, very well. Um, let's go open up uh, this Win64. So I've got... Uh, industrial controller just on the desk over there and I've got two of these medical devices plugged into my network. Here is the project's, uh, well this, this is the uh, source for the workstation manager which will get built as a component as well. You can see it's, it uh, uses uh, T2 workstation, T2 and Viper. If I open this up, I have a little folder I call verification. It's just full of whatever tools that uh, I'll be using when it comes time to uh, perform um, component level verification. If I open it up, very, very live view interface here. Um, here we see uh, on the left, that's an object definition. It's in JSON this time. It's very slim because this doesn't do a lot apart from instantiate uh, T2 workstations. And they get instantiated on the fly and they get their own uh, object definition put into them as needed. I'll just fire this up and now it's going to deploy. Just a heads up, you've got five minutes. Okay, oh, cool. All right, I should be able to do it. <laughs> it's good timing. <sighs> Just want to respond. Oh, there we go. It's slow, it's slow today. I'm very impressed with these industrial controls, just fantastic. So I've got two uh, T2s. Um, I'm going to label uh, one of them as workstation one. That's the IP address, but I'll add the workstation. 
So it's added it and it went out and connected to it. It instantiated a new uh, T2 workstation that manages that and connected to it. So I'll add one, add the other one. And there we are, we connected. I can talk to workstation one and query its status. This HMI ID is useful because HMIs are going to be connected in, have an ID, going to request data, that ID needs to travel back with the data, so that will change the HMI send it to. So that's why that's there. Should do. There you go, you can see different data coming through in the elapsed time and different devices right, sitting over there. So that's, uh, that's, that's Viper, Viper RT. Um, I will soon be uh, releasing the, uh, the Windows only version of Viper um, uh, very soon. Um, I'll just put it up on GitHub and uh, I want to do a little bit of documentation around it. But I'll, I'll put a shout out once that's, that's up and I'll continue to work on this. And once I'm, I'm happy with releasing it, I'll, I'll do so. But it, uh, there are a few things to do. Uh, I need to build um, uh, like, a, a, like a wizard to, to generate the, the code or generate the project. And uh, I also need to look at how I do an object editor for this, for systems that sit down on RT. Um, it becomes a new problem. So, but I'm, I'm thinking about how to solve that. Um, but um, yeah, so any any questions? I think we're sort of towards the end, aren't we? Uh, yeah, we, you got one question um, from Ernesto, but you just answered. Oh, yes. Uh, he wanted to know if Viper was openly available. It's going to be very shortly. So um, I'll be um, putting it on GitHub and uh, also try and uh, build a, um, a package for package manager and, and, uh, and put it up that, that way as well. So it will just install down into your, into your project um, templates and you'll be able to use it. So if you're just doing uh, Windows systems, then, then it's perfect and you can just go, go ahead and use it. Awesome, Kurt. Thank you. Uh, I, I've got a question. Yeah. You were saying earlier, um, you know, you had to change one of your devices. You had to add the new BK device. And yeah. so then you only had to change or, or retest that module. Yeah. Um, would you not have to, you know, retest the, the, the overall sequence or is the sequence you know, separate enough. The sequence, sequence didn't change, the, 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 yeah. the test spec, if you like. Um, but look, you know, there are often other um, sort of levels of, um, you know, pro and other processes that go through when you when you make change that, uh, that are always there, no matter how you how you do this, whether it's, um, you know, Viper or, or, or you know, the big ball of mud. Um, so there's always uh, sort of a level of system um, verification that has to be done no matter what, but it's not exhaustive like the whole um, verification protocols that get uh, executed. It's, uh, yeah. Right. Uh, you got a suggestion from Philippe. He says, put it on VIPM.io. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Community package. I am. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good suggestion. I'll have to look at how I do that, but uh, I'm sure Philip can help me. Cool. Uh, well, um, I'm happy to go into the is it the back room or the backstage and uh, talk a little bit more if anybody wants to follow. All right. Okay. Cool. Build a package and submit it. Okay. Cool. Well, thanks everyone. It's uh, hit five o'clock. So, um, look, any questions, uh, you can easily email me, um, Kurt Friday. Uh, so, Kurt at medulla.net uh, or LinkedIn, you'll find me there. So, um, happy to answer any questions. And if anybody wants to do a Zoom 
and I can show you some more or chat a little bit more about it, more than happy to. And uh, also a manufacturing platform, if you're interested in that, then have a talk to us about that as well. Um, that's, uh, um, we, we're using that for, for medical device uh, manufacturing. Uh, it's been used up in Cook Medical, and we've got a couple more uh, that are using it. So um, if you're in manufacturing, um, I'm sure that might be of interest. All right, we better move to the breakout room. Okay. Thanks, Chris. I'll see you there. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.